Thank you for the thrill of returning here um, to my, where my national security was literally born. Um, this is a, a big honor for me to just speak in front of a bunch of distinguished alumni. Um, this is literally where I started down the road um, that took me to Langley, to the Green Zone, to Foggy Bottom, to the Pentagon, and now to the House um, floor. And what I had learned here has carried with me um, the entire time I've been in this crazy, crazy business, and I know that it's been the same for lots of you here. Um, so I decided that national security would be um, my career not long after I arrived here. Um, I had just moved to New York to start SIPA on September 9th, 2011, or 2001, excuse me. And um, we are the class that had 9-11 uh, happen in our first week of school. Um, and just to give you a, a sense on that day, um, I was in a remedial math class. I don't know if anyone else had to take that before they <laughs> went to economics. Um, I did. And I stepped out to make copies of something. And another student said, it's so weird, a little commuter plane just hit uh, the World Trade Center. Um, and from there, hundreds of students gathered around what is now the now gone student lounge where your, the career center is. There was one TV. Um, and I would say 300 students gathered around that television. We watched the second plane hit. We watched the towers come down. Um, we organized to go donate blood. We thought there'd be a lot of wounded. Um, folks were fielding calls. We didn't have cell phones at the time, really, so people were fielding calls at the hospitals um, from families calling every single hospital trying to find their loved ones. And we organized a housing lottery. I had two people sleep on my floor. They couldn't get over the bridges and the tunnels to get home. Um, in our shock, um, I think all of us knew at that moment and certainly learned that we were witnessing a generational event. Right? One of those very rare moments in all of our lives um, where people of a certain age remember exactly where they were and who they were with and what they were doing when it happened. And for me, I was at SEPA. Um, and those events and that feeling in New York City in the few weeks after 9-11 changed my life and how I would spend it forever. And I know I am not alone in this. Um, that day was galvanizing for many of you. It was the birth of what I call the 9-11 generation. Um, that's a generation that was coming of age as young adults right when 9-11 happened, um, and um, a generation that went to war almost immediately, um, and then came home to carry on our service and our leadership in our own communities, now in business and in government, and even a few uh, political candidates. Uh, I'm incredibly fortunate that at that moment when so many of us had an urge to do something, anything, um, I was here at SEPA. Um, I was at a place that gave me background and knowledge and skills to do more than just watch the news. Um, a year after the attacks, I was recruited here on campus by the CIA to be a Middle East analyst. Um, I must give credit here where credit is due. I don't know if Dick Betts knows this story, but Professor Betts is the entire reason I ended up at the CIA. Um, I had been in development, frankly, in international development. So um, uh, I never thought of the CIA as a place that I would end up. Um, but I got this email from Professor Betts saying, we signed you up for a small lunch with the CIA recruiters that are coming to the faculty house. And I was um, so, um, um, I so liked slash was intimidated by Dr. Betts <laughs> that um, I'm trying to find the right word that combines those. I was in great reverence of Dr. Betts. And so I was like, shoot, you know, I'm never joined the CIA, but like I got to throw on my one suit and get to that event. Um, and that is what I did, and um, I ended up a year later um, at the CIA, and within six or eight months of that, I was on my first tour in Iraq. I'm an Iraq um, Shia militia specialist by training. Um, so um, we are a very long 18 years from that unity of purpose that we felt after 9-11, and the struggles of the years that followed in foreign policy, and if we are honest with ourselves, the damaging mistakes and misjudgments have created what I see as an enormous trust deficit we now have between America's foreign policy, policy leadership and the people that we serve. Um, because things like the invasion of Iraq, the seemingly never-ending wars in Afghanistan um, and the Middle East, and what feels like an inability to actually help people in places like Syria, um, have left large numbers of Americans, especially young Americans, um, in a place where they have lost trust with our ability to succeed abroad. 
Um, and I want to put that down for this crowd as a very big red light, uh, like a flashing red light. Um, we are here talking about foreign policy because we are all in, excited and invested in it. But in places where I'm from, like Michigan, people believe that we are often um, making things worse when America engages abroad. And that is fundamentally different than the generations that came before this current one. Um, trust um, is our currency as foreign policy professionals. It is the coin of the realm. And we cannot conduct our professional duties around the world without trust abroad. Um, we cannot lead abroad without the trust of our fellow Americans back at home. So um, it worries me as a national security professional and now as a member of Congress um, that there are so many principles that we learned here at SEPA that are now under threat. Many people have either forgotten about or lost faith in critical institutions like NATO. The foundation of security and prosperity we have enjoyed since the end of World War II may actually be eroding. Um, and so I want to talk today, I thought I'd take the opportunity um, to talk about what I believe is the most important mission for all of us who have made foreign policy and national security a career, which is reestablishing trust with our partners abroad and with our constituents back home. Um, so let me start with a value statement. Um, I believe that America's allies and partners are indispensable to our physical and economic security. Um, as the NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg just said last week, speaking in front of a joint session of Congress, um, the strength of our nation is not only measured by our size, um, of the size of the economy or the number of soldiers, but also by the number of friends we have. And at a place like SEPA, that's a given. It's a truism, a commonplace thought. But in 2019 in America, it's a debatable proposition controversial enough to force Secretary of Defense Mattis to resign because he believed in it. But the United States did not win the Second World War or triumph in the Cold War on our own. Um, we did not eliminate the territory of ISIS um, alone, and we will not succeed in staring down authoritarian, authoritarianism around the world alone. Um, our partners and allies are indispensable, and in a world of globalized threats, we need a global response. Um, as Secretary Stoltenberg said, we, when we stand together, we are stronger than any potential challenger, economically, politically, and militarily. But we have not treated our allies and partners as, as indispensable over the past two years. And please don't get me wrong, I spent a lot of time under the Obama administration and the Bush administration pushing our European allies in particular to increase their defense spending, um, to more equitably share the burden um, of supporting the NATO alliance. When I was working at the Pentagon uh, before 2017, I actually helped then Secretary of Defense Carter um, create a color-coded chart in red, yellow, and green um, that demonstrated which coalition members were um, meeting their commitments and who was not. It was not a well-loved chart among our allies. Um, so I'm very aware of the disagreements that happen in coalition life um, and that America can and should seek greater contributions from our allies. But that is just it. Um, we ask these allies to step up because we need them. Lasting relationships need to be nurtured even when we don't always see eye to eye. They are relationships and not transactions. We cannot treat our allies as burdens or as cash cows and expect them to deliver when we ask. Um, trust is about having each other's back and trust is one with sound judgment, reliability, dependability. And an erratic partner is the worst kind. And an erratic partner that uses Twitter is really the worst. <laughs> um, so as we know back home in Michigan, the American handshake has to mean something. But in order to ensure that it does, we have to follow some good old fashioned principles to earn back that trust. So um, without further ado, allow me to share some of those basic principles brought to you from the good people of Michigan. Um, first, Number one, get your story straight before you tell it all over town, right? The U.S. needs to be deliberate, deliberative in our national security decisions. Um, foreign policy decisions should never be made by one person, one agency, or one branch of government. We are a system of checks and balances, and in an ideal situation, we have vociferous debate within the U.S. government, um, decide to move out, um, and go on with our lives. 
foreign policy by tweet is just simply very bad policy. It's damaging to relationships built over decades. Um, and so too is the fact that partners and allies um, cannot be certain that senior, any senior government official right now is actually speaking for the US government. That is very bad for building back trust. Okay, second, make friends with everyone because you'll never know who you need. Different threats will require different coalitions. For a particular cyber threat, for instance, a small Baltic nation may actually be the specific country you need because they house the servers to actually contradict and push back on a cyber threat. In another war zone, you may need to retain and tra retrain the national police. So countries like Spain and Italy, who have national police forces, might actually be our lead ally in those efforts. And yet another theater we may need um, to access technology to counter Chinese art artificial intelligence. We simply do not know enough about how the conflicts of the future will look. Um, so we better make friends with everybody so we can maximize our chances of pushing back on those threats. Okay, third, Rev this is a sports analogy, so come on New Yorkers, play with me here. Um, <laughs> review the play with the team before you run it, right? Um, so we need to include allies and partners in our planning. Just like a sports team can't successfully execute a play if each member on the team does not know their role, you cannot over-communicate when you're fighting together. Our partners bring complementary skills and assets to the table, and the best way to capitalize on them is to communicate early and often. Okay, and lastly, and this goes out to everyone who's been like doing foreign policy since 9-11, for God's sake, under promise and over deliver, right? We need to be clear with ourselves, with our allies, with our public about our goals and objectives abroad and how we can practically plan to achieve them. We will not solve every problem. We are not gonna bring grandiose ideas of Jeffersonian democracy to the Middle East, right? Our goals have been too high, too extreme, and therefore the public has seen us um, and our allies have seen us failing. Um, so please, please, under promise. In the absence of trust, we know that our partners and allies will not stand still and wait for us to find our footing. They face their own urgent challenges. Um, and if we can't engage with them in a consistent and reliable manner, our friends will go it alone. At some point, the trust will be too far gone and America will be shut out of key decisions for the first time since World War II. Um, allies won't be willing to take the political hit of working with the United States, um, and we will be less safe and less prosperous as a result. So we face a trust deficit abroad, um, and it's no small part because we also face a growing uh, deficit here at home. There is a direct correlation between U.S. public support and the view that uh, and, and in leading abroad and the view that they take of allies and partners. As someone who represents Michigan, um, let me tell you, there is a lack of trust in our national security institutions and the ideas and philosophies that animate them. Um, this lack of trust has led to an America-only foreign policy for lots of people. Um, and I wanna be clear that domestic policies really truly matter in our craft. So when I decided to run for office, um, the it, it was in the beginning because of national security issues. Uh, I had worked for both Democrats and Republicans, and I just felt that the tenor of, and tone of politics in Washington had become fundamentally unbecoming of the country that I served and the country that we all love. Um, but what actually got me in the race was healthcare. And my mom's particular experience of being diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer when she did not have health insurance. Um, and because of that experience, I did my best to talk to people in my district and learn the things that really mattered to them. Um, and those things tend to be, in my district, the price of health care, the price of prescription drugs, and infrastructure. Um, um, I was one of a number of people with national security backgrounds that ran um, and actually won last November. Um, and it wasn't complicated. It wasn't, people often ask me, was it a huge transition? And I say, no. We won because we spent more time than our opponents talking to voters about the things that mattered to them and in a language that resonated with them. We earned their trust um, uh, that we would work on the things that mattered to them. Um, so my point here in saying this is that 
Um, for us in government and in national security, the needs of the people that we serve have to come first. Um, and that isn't just on domestic policy. When I talk to voters in my towns, um, in my district, about NATO or our alliance with South Korea or our battlefield partners in Syria, it is not enough for me to make the SEPA case for those relationships, the policy-based, slightly wonky case for those relationships. Um, I have to make the local case, the case that resonates with families who are worried about their ability to afford college or their mortgage or their doctor's bill. NATO means very little to someone who cannot afford the insulin for their child every month. So we have to make the case that these institutions and what you all do makes people safer. It protects their kids. Um, it makes them more prosperous. Um, and when they have doubts or questions about criticisms, we have to respond to them. We have to speak to them or else the machinery of global security and economic growth will not just sputter and malfunction, it will grind to a halt. So when we talk about the need for global partnerships or you know, multipolar world or to confront the return of great power competition, um, we, we're talking to one another in this room. That is a, an insider baseball conversation. What I'm proposing is that we, you and I need to start thinking and talking about foreign policy in ways that are relevant to people's lives. So what does this mean in practical terms? Okay, one, speak to people's pocketbooks or their kids. I've been asked today, even just in a few minutes being here, like how do we explain to people you know, that NATO's important? It can't be the wonky answer that takes us back to World War II and the global order. And explain to my dad who was in the meat business his entire life, we're hot dog people, um, <laughs> explained to him how NATO makes his grandchildren safer. And not in a wonky way, in a real concrete way. That's not something we're used to doing. We are not trained in that kind of communication in this field. And what I am telling you is we have got to get those skills like right quick, right quick. Um, uh, the, um, the other piece, and number two, tell stories, not policy. Human beings are wired for stories. That's why cavemen painted cave paintings, right? That's why we all love our, our TV and our movies. Um, we need to communicate in different ways. So instead of having the policy want conversation about deterrence and why that's important, try and explain the situation for a young Baltic man um, who's dealing with real Russian threats to his country. Um, the policy analysis just does not work. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, and I say this um, knowing that it may be slightly controversial, we need to check our superiority at the door. We're not doing the American public a favor by talking to them about foreign policy. They are doing us a favor by listening. Whether you're a CIA analyst in Baghdad or a platoon leader in Kandahar or a member of Congress or the President of the United States, your, pocket, your bosses are the taxpayers and we cannot do what this room wants to do unless we have their support. They also vote. Um, and when any of us vote, we tend to prioritize the candidates and the issues that speak to our daily concerns. Um, so I would say this is me deputizing all of you to please become advocates for what you do and for this field for parts of the country that don't tend to think about it every day. Um, so this is a pretty daunting assignment that history has handed our generation of national security leaders. Our predecessors spent decades building and strengthening institutions um, of the global security order aided by a really strong consensus back home. But we are witnessing in real time an attempt to dismantle or discredit those institutions and undermine the domestic consensus of their value. Um, and if we are to provide the same level of security and prosperity that previous generations enjoyed, um, I really do believe it falls to us to restore and reconstruct the partnerships and the alliances that America has so successfully led and our trust with people back home. It will not be easy, but it must be done. Um, they deserve and need, Americans deserve and need safety and security and American leadership. I am still a strong believer in a strong leadership role for the United States and the world. Um, 
but we need national security leaders that can speak to everyday concerns and values. They deserve foreign policy leaders they can trust, and it is our responsibility to provide it. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about that issue, and uh, I look forward to your questions.